Now, this is the multi track that goes up on here. The studios of Madrid opened in the summer of 1964, around June. And from the beginning, it included this, which is um, the multi track has 10 stereo playback heads. I don't think it's able to make recordings, right? No, only playback. Yes. So you got to do your recordings on other machines, and then you can do loops, stereo loops, or a stereo full reels with whatever length. And they are placed here. Here are the 10 different stereo heads. And there is only um, there is only one reel. If you think about the conventional tape recorder, that is one reel with tape that goes into the tape up reel on the other side. No, the, the tape is just freely falls down into these bins, very small cabinets, and. Or if there is a loop, I think there was kind of a weight, a little weight that will keep the loop down. And then when you are finished, you just hit rewind, and all the tape, like spaghetti, goes up into the proper ring. I never saw it getting mixed up with anything. Can you imagine all these different ten reels of tape with all the tape on the floor? How messy it could be. But this was clever. It just worked. It worked like gravity. It just went down, and then hit rewind. It went up. So, the one he used for Dripsody, it was the, the one I understood with six stereo heads. And it looks actually quite different. I remember that it has like tape rates going in every one direction like a trim. So this was much neater. Uh, the keyboard is not for playing notes or pitches or anything like that. It's to control speed. So there is only one capstan running at seven and a half inches per second or 15 inches per second. So all 10 stereo heads, they are connected to only one motor, one capstan. But the keyboard is a speed variation control. So you could key in by changing the voltage, the changing the electricity feeding the motor, you could slow down or speed up the uh, axis, the motor and the capstan that is common to all 10 uh, different stereotypes or loops. Get the idea? So in a way, it's a huge mixing machine. Then we can go to the mixer. So there's up to 20 channels of information. And if everything is closed, you hear nothing. All the tapes might be running. If you only use the tape loops, they keep on running and interacting in different uh, written proportions, one compared with the others in the family. And you could just start opening certain faders or sliders and collecting the information on a recording, tape recorder elsewhere. What I remember is that this unit had here Two excellent, fantastic for the time, the spring reverb like delay echo machines. Well, 1964, you could not go to the music store and order a lexicon or Alessis Welsh digital delay or anything, they just didn't exist. Either you run some sort of tape loop to do tape feedback or you use coming from electric guitar technology, a spring pattern. These were high quality and steady, which means total separation between the two channels, no mixing. So it was part of the processing you could do. And if my memory serves me well, the machine has up to 20 inputs that you can release out, but it has, was it six outputs? Support, they were called A, B, C, D. I think there were six outputs. So you could send the outputs 
group outputs, yeah, they were, they were letter code. So the group outputs were P, Q, R, S, T, U. There was a common output, and that's it. So, you can send it to six different places. Which could be these places? The six different filters. So the machine, the system was integrated so there would be kind of a feedback situation between the different machines. I, I, I think this, the multi-track tape recorder is just a master piece of, as a conception, as an idea. And only five were built. It was never truly commercialized. Let's see, Toronto, Montreal, Kingston, Ottawa, and the fifth one went to Tel Aviv. <laughs> the composer Joseph Tal, an Israeli composer who until about two years ago was still alive at 94, when we were doing the research for the Music World magazine, we tracked him down. And there was some difficult correspondence because we couldn't find a real common language. And then one day he even called me on the telephone, talking to someone who is 94 and who doesn't speak English or French or Spanish. It wasn't easy. Um, but he was visiting around 1960 as a guest of Canada and came to Ottawa, the NRC, and fell in love with this machine. Sorry, machine. <laughs> fell in love with the machine and somehow the probably at the instigation of Hugh Decay, the government of Canada decided to give one multi-track as a donation to the state of Israel. So when I did the research with Levin Richter, we wanted to know if Joseph Tal could tell us what happened with that machine. So apparently still, in the, it's not being used, it's in the Jerusalem studio. Other people keep a time a long time ago, Joseph Tal. So other people are running it and um, he, Joseph Tal said it was never very successful because as soon as they put it to work in the 60s, it broke down. And well, Ottawa to Jerusalem is quite a distance, but I think someone went there. I don't know if they came there. They tried to fix it at one point. He's in the book, by the book. <laughs> Okay. Also, buy the CD. It's a huge decay CD. I don't know if we are selling it here. A few copies, my students can get it from me. Uh, I think that Gay Young and like a society, friends of Hugh McCain, released that as an LP many years ago, 10, 12. Wonderful LP. And now it has been re released as a CD.